Hey there, welcome to Live Wire. I'm your host, Luke Burbank. This week on the show, we are talking about losing, but also about finding things with New Yorker writer Katherine Schultz, talking about her incredible book, Lost and Found, which discusses her losing her father at the same time that she was finding and falling in love with her wife. Then we're going to be talking to Keenan Lowe. Keenan was a former football star here in Oregon who returned to his hometown to coach a high school team and to sort of refine his sense of purpose. And during that time, he managed to disarm a student who brought a gun to school. He disarmed him with a hug. It's an incredible story that you don't want to miss. Then we're going to hear some music from one of our favorites and definitely the funniest musician we know, John Craigie. Speaking of finding things, we're so glad you found Livewire this week, which all gets started right after this. Ever wondered what it's like to live alone, hidden in the woods, not speaking to a single soul for 30 years, or wander the desert, uncover a hidden well, and dive to the bottom of the deepest water hole for 2,000 miles? The Snap Judgment Podcast takes you there with amazing stories told by the people who lived them. Snap Judgment. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Hey there, Elena. Hey, Luke. How's it going? It's going really well. Uh, excited to play a round of station location identification with you this week, although this one is a little bit Let's just say boutique. I want to manage everyone's expectation of this, including yours. Okay, okay. <laughs> you take this very seriously, of I course. Do. This is where I quiz Elena about a place that Livewire is on the radio. Uh, she's got to guess where I am talking about. I mean, your success rate with this is incredible. Again, this one is uh, is a a beautiful but maybe slightly out of the way place where we're on the radio. Mm, that's um, a hint in itself. Well, mm. it was uh, home to Pulitzer Prize winning journalist William Allen White. His house was called Red Rocks, and it's a historical landmark there. People who visited that house include Theodore Roosevelt, Herbert Hoover, and Calvin Coolidge. Hmm. How about this? This city is home of the National Teachers Hall of Fame, a museum dedicated to honoring exceptional career teachers and the heritage of the teaching profession. Is it Des Moines, Iowa? Oh, you are in the right part of the world. Maybe head more to Jayhawk territory. Oh, is it Topeka, Kansas? <laughs> <laughs> it is in Kansas, and it's a town which their name has always made me think that they must sell a lot of stuff. Like, it sounds like a store. Walmart, Kansas. <laughs> Emporia, Kansas, <laughs> where we are broadcasting on K-A-N-H, Kansas Public Radio. They're in Emporia, Kansas. I can't wait to visit. <laughs> Should we get to the radio show? Let's do it. All right, take it away. From PRX, it's... <laughs> This week, writer Katherine Schultz. I think actually a lot of this book, although it is about losing and about finding and love and grief, is actually about how you kind of take the side of joy. And football coach and author Keenan Lowe. In losing my best friend, I ended up saving a young man's life inside a school by following my heart. With music from John Craigie. As a kid, I was the funny guy, so people who knew me as a kid, they'll come to the show and they're like, hey, not bad on the music, you know. <laughs> and our fabulous house band. I'm your announcer, Elena Passarello, and now, the host of LiveWire, Luke Burbank. Hey, thank you so much, Elena Passarello. Thanks to everyone all over the country for tuning in, including the fine folks in Emporia, Kansas. Uh, of course, we ask LiveWire listeners a question each week. This week we asked, what's the coolest thing you've ever found? We're talking to the writer, Katherine Schultz, about her really incredible book, Lost and found. We're going to hear those listener responses coming up in just a few moments. First, though, we got to kick things off with the best news we heard all week. Best news. This is our little reminder at the top of the show that there is some good news happening out there in the world. Elena, what is the best news that you heard all week? <laughs> well, I guess this is sort of in keeping with the lost and found theme because this story involves a loss of revenue. <laughs> okay. Wow. All right. Way to make that work. It's a best news because it's funny. A couple weeks ago, it was just this random Thursday night in Chesterfield Township, Michigan, 
And six-year-old Mason was winding down with his dad, Keith, at the end of the day. And Mason, every evening, gets 30 minutes on his dad's phone uh, to play an educational app. Um, (laughs) And then, usually, because he's six, it's kind of a struggle to get Mason to go to bed. But on this particular night, after 30 minutes, he handed the phone back and he was like, good night. And he ran upstairs and went to bed. And Keith, his dad, was like, all right. And then the doorbell rang. Oh, my goodness. And then he saw another pair of headlights in the driveway and the doorbell rang again and he finally went outside and there was close to a literal ton of Grubhub food (laughs) (laughs) waiting on the porch. We're talking a hundred pieces of jumbo shrimp. We're talking multiple chicken sandwiches, pizzas out the waz, grape leaves galore from a bunch of different restaurants. Yeah, dolmas from a shawarma place. There was a Coney Island (laughs) hot dog place, a pizza place. Love the range for Mason. You know, a lot of six-year-olds. Not going for the dolmas. So you you figured it out that it was Mason who did this. And <laughs> I was able to, um, you know, just kind of jump maybe to the end of the story there. I don't mean to step on your ending. Oh, no. Um, it, well, I, you know, once Keith figured it out, he stormed upstairs and there was Mason and he was in his bed and he says the covers were pulled up to his eyes and, <laughs> and he started, and his dad started to talk to him about the fact that he had just charged a thousand dollars worth of Grubhub onto his dad's account. And Mason held his hand out and said, hold on one second, dad. Dad, have the pepperoni pizzas come yet? (laughs) (laughs) Um, But luckily, because Mason's mom, Keith's wife, has an at-home bakery business, they have a bunch of fridges and freezers and ways of storing this food. They're also going to give some of the food away. And then when Grubhub found out about this little snafu, they gave the family $1,000 worth of Grubhub gift cards, which is really just enabling Mason to do this again, as far as I'm concerned. (laughs) Well, it was an educational app. That's for right. Mason. That's he right. learned that he's not supposed to do that anymore. That's correct. Yes. All right. From a young person doing something that was probably not totally okay to a different young person doing something that's really amazing. The best news that I saw this week, of course, it was Valentine's Day. Mm-hmm. And it's the story of uh, a young guy named Patrick Kaufman, who a few years ago when he was 10 years old, he was volunteering at a uh, District of Columbia food nonprofit. And they were sending out food to folks uh, who were both children and adults who were dealing with illness. And he started making these little Valentine's cards to tuck into the meals that were going out to people's house. He's 10 years old and he's doing this. And he makes like 30 of these Valentine's cards just to brighten the day of someone who's having this food delivered. And so the next year, he decides to try to uh, see if he can uh, up the ante a little bit. And he starts getting students at his school to make some of these Valentine's cards, and they get 300 of them made, these little handmade Valentine's cards. And they're tucking them into meals that are going out to folks who are dealing with cancer, HIV, AIDS, and other serious uh, illnesses. So then it's last year, and, you know, Patrick is on a roll with this stuff. He actually goes around and gets several District of Columbia schools to put together 3,000 Valentine's Day cards for people who might not otherwise get a Valentine's Day card. Oh, my gosh. Which brings us, Elena, to what he did this year. Oh, my gosh. There's more. (laughs) (laughs) But wait, there's more. He organized the creation and delivery of 16,000 handwritten, handmade, one-of-a-kind Valentine's Day cards to go out to people in D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. He got 62 schools involved with making these cards, again, just to brighten the day of folks who are dealing with illness or food insecurity, people who may be elderly, just wouldn't maybe be getting a Valentine's card. 16,000 people in that area are going to get a handmade Valentine's card thanks to the work of Patrick and his friends at all these schools. What grade is this kid in? He is now 14, which raises the question, what are any of us doing with our lives? I know. (laughs) I thought this was really cute. One of Patrick's cohort in this whole thing, a kid named Max Rappaport. Max is 10 years old. He's in fifth grade. And the Washington Post caught up with him as he was making one of these Valentine's cards. And he was uh, taping large purple hearts to the front of the card, uh, a light pink heart in the middle of the card, and then he wrote a poem. Max Rappaport, age 10, wrote a Valentine's poem to somebody that he has never met. Roses are red, violets are blue. We think you are amazing. You just have to know it too. (laughs) I mean, it doesn't get any more adorable than that. So 
Max and Patrick and all of those school children and the adults that are helping them out, making 16,000 people have a really great Valentine's Day this year. That is the best news that I heard all week. All right, let's welcome our first guest on over to the program. She's a staff writer for The New Yorker, where she won a Pulitzer Prize. Her work has also appeared in The Best American Travel Writing, The Best American Food Writing as well. Her latest book is Lost and Found. It's a memoir. It talks about losing her father at about the same time that she was finding uh, the love of her life. Here is our chat with Katherine Schultz, recorded in front of a live audience at the Holt Center for the Performing Arts in Eugene, Oregon. Catherine, welcome to the show. Thank you. This book is, first of all, it is absolutely incredible. I can't say enough about it, and it has so many different elements to it. It's, in a way, sort of a two-parter. It talks about uh, the, the loss of your father. It also talks about you finding the love of your life, it's sort of woven together at the end. I'm curious when you thought that this life experience is something that could make a good book. It was the love, <laughs> as it so often is. Uh, I had written a little bit about my father's death uh, not long uh, after I lost him. Uh, and I wrote about it in the context of losing all these other things, keys, cell phones, elections. It was a bad year. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I didn't really want to spend two, three, four years of my life uh, just thinking about grief. Uh, but there was this moment when I realized, ah, well, there's this mirror image story I could tell that... Mm would kind of explore the, the category of discovery. Um, but, but that would have the emotional heart um, of, uh, of a love story at the core of it. And that, to me, started seeming awfully interesting. Um, you also really go into a bit of a deep dive on just the science of losing things, mm. starting with the fact that a lot of us don't really fully understand the origin of the word lost. Yeah, yeah I was quite surprised by that. Um, you know, when we say something like, I lost my father, I had just always assumed that that was, frankly, a euphemism, like saying, oh, my father passed or whatever. But it felt really right to me, and I don't normally like euphemism, so I got kind of interested in the word, and it turned out I was completely wrong. Actually, originally, the very earliest use of loss when it showed up in the English language uh, had that sense of being separated from someone you love or, or, or being bereft, in a sense. In fact, that, that word lost is related to the lorn in forlorn. So mm. it's, it's always had this note of real grief and sorrow inside mm. it. Is it um, true that the average person loses nine items a day? I That's mean, in this book, and I was shocked by that. It's quite shocking. Yes, according to like insurance companies and places that bother to gather information like this, I like to think that at least two members of my family have skewed the average so drastically <laughs> in the direction of loss that the rest of us only lose like two or three things a day, but uh -huh. apparently it's true. Um, you, you write in this book about the sort of two theories as to why we lose things, and, and one is kind of scientific and the other is... I guess you would say Freudian in some way. What are the what are the theories on that? Yeah, I mean the short version is I think they're both kind of unsatisfying. But the <laughs> the scientific one is you know our our minds are fallible as you might imagine, and and we fail to either encode a memory of where we left something, or we encode it just fine and we fail to retrieve the memory, and so lo and behold, like who knows where my cell phone is. <laughs> um, the the psychological one is actually frankly much more interesting, um, but I'm personally inclined to think it's bunk. Uh, that's the theory that, you know, you only lose something that you just want out of your life. You know, that's the Freudian idea, that's right? That's the Freudian idea. Like, I lost my cell phone because I'm tormented by modern technology, mm. and I, or I, there's some text message in it I can't bear to read, and so, you know, it goes missing, and the minute I resolve my deep emotional issues about cell phones, it will, you know, rematerialize <laughs> in my life. That's happened for me never. <laughs> This is Livewire from PRX. We are talking to writer Katherine Schultz about her latest book, Lost and Found. When we come back, we're going to find out how Katherine managed having a deadline for a Pulitzer Prize winning article for The New Yorker and also going on a first date with her future wife. This all happened on the same day. We're going to hear about it coming up on Livewire. Livewire is brought to you in part by Alaska Airlines. Alaska Airlines offers the most non-stops from the West Coast, including destinations like Hawaii, Costa Rica, and Belize. And as a member of the One World Alliance, 
Alaska Airlines can connect you to more than 1,000 destinations worldwide with their global partners. Learn more at alaskaair.com. Welcome back to LiveWire, coming to you this week from the Holt Center here in Eugene, Oregon. I'm Luke Burbank here with Elena Passarello. We are talking with New Yorker writer Katherine Schultz about her latest book, Lost and Found. Um, this book focuses, the first part of the book, on your father, who was just an absolutely brilliant man, but also hopeless with losing things, with just whatever it would be, keys, passports, you name it. Is there anything to that idea of the kind of absent-minded genius or that our brains are only capable of, of being good at, like, knowing about the law or baseball in his case, but not remembering where our stuff is? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm always reluctant to give too much credence to stereotypes, but it is incredible the degree to which my father, despite not actually being a professor, was truly an absent-minded professor. And I did sometimes feel like, well, you know, what's rattling around in your brain? You know, seven languages that you're fluent in all of, you know, he spoke English more beautifully than I ever could hope to, and that was his last language. You know, write all of his kind of legal studies. He was a, he was a lawyer. Um, the entire works of, you know, the Western canon, basically. And I thought, well, maybe there's just not room to remember where your other shoe is. It could happen. <laughs> yeah. Your dad's story is really incredible. He was um, born in Tel Aviv. Then you write in the book, and I had to reread this a couple times because I wanted to make sure I was getting it right. You write, in one of the more unlikely trajectories in the history of modern Judaism, they left what was about to be the state of Israel and moved to, wait for it, Holt Center, Germany. <laughs> I mean, for history buffs out there, in February of 1948. <laughs> oh, my God. What? I, I, was t I had no idea that that was, a mi however microscopic, that that was a migration that was happening. It's quite unusual. I mean, there were certainly still Jews in Germany, you know, some who had survived. And then, as it turns out, there were quite a lot of refugee camps in Germany. So some people went just to try to reunite with families there. Mm. But no, no, not my family. They weren't trying to reunite. My grandfather was frankly trying to make a buck, um, <laughs> which in fairness, they were desperately poor. Uh, and he had three children by then and, and wanted to feed them. And he had heard, as it turns out correctly, that it was possible to make a pretty decent living on the black market in post-war Germany. So some of my father's earliest memories are, you know, like of being in his dad's sidecar on his motorcycle, <laughs> basically like being a decoy. He was sitting there, this very cute little round-cheeked adorable boy on top of a stack of like American cigarettes and like, like a camera. <laughs> that's, that's what brought them to Germany. One of the things that comes through in this book is your dad's incredibly kind of ebullient personality and how he just kind of lit up every room he was in. And considering the trauma of his childhood, have, have you sort of tried to figure out how it is that he as a person was able to, you know, push past that or push it far enough into the rearview mirror that he could live, you know, the life that you saw him living? I certainly have thought about it a lot. And in some ways, I think it's actually kind of the, it's very close to the heart of this book in the sense that I think actually a lot of this book, although it is about losing and about finding and love and grief, is actually about how you kind of take the side of joy, even in the face of pain and suffering. And the thing I admired about my dad, it's, it's not like he just was sort of glib and a, a Pollyanna optimist. He just, um, he, he somehow managed to have this, as you say, a bullion, joyful spirit, uh, while still looking squarely in the face that the various woes of the world. Um, how he was like that is a real mystery. I mean, that, that's kind of the mystery, right? Like, yeah. how, how, why are we the way we are? Why are some people able to find joy in those moments? Mm -hmm. And I, I write toward that, but I, if I had an answer, um, they'd be paying me more money to be in a much larger auditorium. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, next year we're getting over to the, the real, the biggie. Yeah. I promise. That's our, that's our goal. Um, the, uh, we're talking to Catherine Schultz about her book, Lost and Found. The found part of this book is you finding your now wife, um, a couple things about that. One, you describe your first date with her, that some mutual friends had set you up and she was passing through uh, where you were living in, I think the Hudson Valley, and you go out and you have this spectacular uh, afternoon together and you're completely bewitched. And then at the end, you say that you, you were surprised that she wanted to go on another date because you didn't realize or know if she was gay. Mm. What did you think was going on on this date? <laughs> 
impressed you're the first person to ask me that question. <laughs> I know, what was I thinking, right? Like weird, rare, crucial failure of my gaydar. Um, what did I think was going on? Uh, I think maybe there was not sufficient introspection on my part in that okay. moment. I mean, I knew what was happening in my head, which was like, this woman is unbelievably brilliant and incredibly interesting and also strikingly beautiful. And gosh, that shirt looks nice on her and what pretty long fingers. So I, I, it's not that I wasn't having a, a series of thoughts, but um, I don't know. I mean, it's so funny since you've already blown my cover as the author of the earthquake piece. The truth is I was on deadline for that piece during that lunch. No. Oh, the, True the... fact revealed live for the first time. Wow, yes. the the now yes. famous in the Northwest earthquake piece. You were yeah. on deadline for that piece when you met the love of like your life. Two weeks behind deadline, <laughs> so in my mind when I went off to that lunch, you know, we, we I didn't know her from Adam, and it wasn't meant to be a setup. Actually, it was just here's this friend of a friend driving through town. I'll be nice. I'll go have lunch. But when I set off for that lunch, I was like. 45 minutes tops, you know, <laughs> yes, I got to eat something, but so fine, I'll meet this stranger. And then, of course, four hours later, there we still are. But it's safe to say I was not, you know, it was not on my game that day. There were two seismic stories unfolding in your life at that time. <laughs> uh, exactly. uh, Can I get a rim shot? No, okay, I don't deserve one for that. Um, uh, the way that you write about your, your wife is like it gives like Neruda a run for his money. Like it is really just one of the most beautiful descriptions of, of two people falling in love and how much a person can love another person and the reasons why they can love that person. I mean, it's just really gorgeous. I'm curious though what it was like for you to write that about the person you are currently in a relationship with and for her to read it later. Because this is a, you know, a hit book. And it's very personal, the stuff you're talking about. And like, had you told her all of that stuff before you wrote it? Like, I like this about you. And with that one time I saw you in the sunlight doing this, like was, what was her, what was the impact on her of reading this? Well, you know, I must say she is a very patient person. <laughs> You know, the truth is there was no indication when we met or frankly when we married that I was going to go off and write a memoir. It's not really my thing. I give you, you know, seismology. That's kind of my thing. Um, but, but then I went and wrote it. And um, <laughs> for me, it was completely delightful, to tell you the truth. I, nothing turns out to be more fun to write than a love story. Uh, and, and, you know, I would... Every day I would sit and kind of work on whatever section I was working on uh, of that love part of the book. And then at night I would take it up to, to bed and kind of read it to her like a bedtime story. And um, it, was, it was delightful, honestly. And, you know, to her great credit, she edited me the way she always edits me, which is to say, like, that's going on too long. But she never <laughs> once said, could you please just not? You know? <laughs> would you ever have like a not great day? Maybe, you know a disagreement about something and you'd be thinking, I gotta rewrite some of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say I haven't had any second thoughts about the love section and I hope never to do so. <laughs> One thing that I am but curious about is that you only use your wife's first initial for the book, um, C. I'm curious why you made that decision. Uh, well, certainly not to keep a secret. My wife is the amazing Casey Sepp, who was on this very show well, right. some years ago. Who wrote author Furious of Hours, the exactly. incredible book about Harper Lee. Um, uh, yes, yes, that's, that's right. right. Yeah. That's the yeah. that's C in this book is Casey Sepp. But, but I'm curious what, why you chose to be a little bit, um, you know, nonspecific. You know, the truth is part of why I uh, shouted out my wife's patience is she actually is a more private person than I am. And I, I think it was she did sort of raise her eyebrows when I embarked on this project, um, but raised them quite privately. Mm. <laughs> and, and I felt when I sat down... The truth is, when I very first tried to do it, I actually, the first scene I wrote, there was no name at all. There was just pronouns. Um, and then it turns out to be grammatically completely unsustainable to do that for more than like six paragraphs. So I gave up on that, but I somehow felt like, well, you know, it, it, felt, it felt right in the way some choices sometimes do in writing. Like, okay, you, you can have this much of her, and, and it's true, and it's, it's honest, and, and she would sign off on it as well, but, but there's all the rest, too, and, and she gets to keep that, and I get to keep that, and her family gets to keep that. So it was a little mm. tiny nod to, you know, memoirs, to some extent, are always acts of withholding as much as they're acts of divulging, and I, huh. on her behalf and mine, withheld a little bit. It seems like a big theme of this book is that the loss that we feel, like particularly when we lose people, is because we found them, mm. you know, and that that's the kind of essential tension of, of life is that, that feeling like you can really only feel the loss of somebody who you found and who made the impact that you know, your father made in your life. Where do you sort of land on that towards the end of the book? Or what are you hoping to kind of say about that? 
I suppose that it's worth it. Mm. <laughs> you know, I think that um, we cannot ward off all loss. Some of them are just baked into the terms of our existence. Uh, and, and frankly, the hardest ones are baked into the terms of our existence. Uh, I hate to break it to you here on this lovely and actually mostly comic and lighthearted night, but you guys are, you're going to lose it all. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're you're going to lose your loved ones. You're, you know, you yourselves are going to die. And uh, I, I guess for me, I do feel that... Um, there's something useful about that knowledge, which is that it, the, the fact that we're going to lose everything does, I think, remind us of how precious it is and remind us to cherish it while we have it and, and to tend to it and, uh, and, and pay attention to it. You know, these are all actually very cliched lessons, but somehow they're impossible to retain. So I, I became the 450 billionth writer to try to write about them. <laughs> but but in, a, in a really incredible way in this book, I can't recommend it highly enough, it's lost and found. Catherine Schultz, everyone. That was Katherine Schultz right here on Livewire. We recorded that at the Holt Center for the Performing Arts in Eugene, Oregon. Catherine's latest book, Lost and Found, is available now. Hey, special thanks this episode to Judy Clark of Portland, Oregon, and Tim Fredrickson, checking in from the Inland Empire of Spokane, Washington. Judy and Tim are part of the Livewire member community and are generously supporting the program with a donation each month, which we are very thankful for because it is genuinely how we are able to keep Livewire going. So a big thanks to Tim and Judy for supporting the program. This is Livewire. Of course, each week we ask our listeners a question based on Katherine Schultz's book, Lost and Found. We ask the listeners, what is the coolest thing you've ever found? Elena has been collecting up those responses. What are you seeing? Uh, I love this one from Tina. Tina says, when I was at the thrift store, I found a sweater that I had given away years ago. It wasn't a common sweater at the time, and it had a hole in the exact spot my old sweater did. I gave the sweater away in Wisconsin, but found it at a thrift store in Chicago, which I mean, they're not too far away from each other, depending on where in Wisconsin you're talking about. So I think that's plausible. That's amazing. Wow. Now, does the listener mention if they then bought the sweater? No. Oh, like, did that... it boomerang back into their life, or did they just kind of wave at it right. in the secondhand store? Like, hello, fellow traveler. Good to see you again. We'll check in in about 15 years. <laughs> um, what's something else cool that somebody found? Um, I like this one from Eric. My great aunt ran off with the tall man in the circus, and among my family's mementos, I found a charm bracelet that he gave her from the World's Fair. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Like, the tall man meaning the guy on the stilts? I'm assuming, yeah. You know, the thing that it makes me think about is no one ever just, you know, walks at a regular pace with someone from the circus. One always must run off Absolutely. It's the only, the only speed the only gate. that you can join the circus at. <laughs> Nobody strolls off with the circus or saunters off with the circus. Yeah. What's something else cool that uh, one of our listeners found? Uh, short and sweet from Angela. Angela found, quote, 20 bucks at a park at night when I was really broke. Oh, yeah. That'll get you out of a couple of jams. Um, and also that feels like the kind of thing where 20 bucks is an amount of money that I think you can keep and not be too worried right. that it's been totally and completely devastating to someone. Like you find a bag full of money or if you find an envelope, yeah. it's got, you know, maybe it says Bailey savings and loan on it. And, uh, you know, <laughs> it's got a bunch it's of Christmas time. Scrooge McDuck dollar signs. <laughs> <laughs> All right, one more cool thing that one of our listeners found before we move on. Oh, this is uh, this is great from Heather. Heather says, my girls and I were out dog walking, and we came across two bikes that were exactly their sizes, and they were practically new, and they were leaning against a tree with a free sign on them. We've been on the hunt for used bikes because they'd both outgrown theirs. That is serendipity. Yeah. I'm so glad, by the way, that we got the detail about a sign that said free, because otherwise Heather is just describing... Theft. Bike theft. <laughs> <laughs> Larceny. We found these two bikes that were perfect. They were just in someone's garage, but the door was open. And we wheeled them right out of there. <laughs> hey, thanks to everyone who sent in a response to our question. We got a question for next week's show, which we will reveal in just a few minutes. In the meantime, uh, just a reminder, this is Livewire Radio. Uh, we've got a very interesting interview that we want to play next. It's with Keenan Lowe. 
Now, Keenan Lowe's story is that he was a big college football star at the University of Oregon, and he eventually ended up coaching in Oregon at Park Rose High in Portland, coaching the football team, when something very intense and very dangerous happened. It was May 17th, 2019. Keenan writes about this in his book. It's called Hometown Victory. And before we get started, just a note that this conversation does mention suicidal ideation and also gun violence. So please listen with care. Uh, this is Keenan Lowe recorded in front of a live audience at the Alberta Rose Theater in Portland, Oregon. Hello, Keenan. Hello. Welcome to the show. Now, you were a star athlete, so you probably did a lot of interviews. What is it like doing, like, book interviews versus I caught a touchdown in the Orange Bowl interviews? <laughs> yeah, usually when you do an athletic interview, it's, it's about the game that just got played, and no game is the same. But at this point, I've done the same interview about 18 times <laughs> in the last two days. So, Do you want to put some pads and, like, eye black on just so it gets yeah. you back in that comfortable Those space? Those days are gone, man. <laughs> Those days are gone for me, so... I'm, I'm excited to be an author now. Yeah. Cool. Well, congratulations. The book is a really good read. And the, the book is a great read. And, and of course, the, the crux of it is this incident that happened at Park Rose, which we'll talk about. But really, the book also goes through your life and experiences. And, um, yeah, well, for instance, the thing that brought you from uh, working for the San Francisco 49ers, you're like on, you know, a track to maybe someday be an NFL head coach or something. And then something happened that ultimately led you to come back to the Portland area. What happened? Yeah, I was on a good path. I, fresh out of college, I got a, a job in the NFL, worked for the Philadelphia Eagles, and, and then worked for the San Francisco 49ers. So I was fresh out of college on a nice career path, and then I get a call from home, and it's one of my friends, and, and uh, he tells me our, our best friend Taylor Martinick passed away of an mm -hmm. opioid overdose, and, and fentanyl uh, ended up taking his life. Mm -hmm. So in that process, I... Um, you know, life happened fast, you know, and I, I came home to, to mourn and, and be with my friends and family. And then when I was home, everything started to make a little bit more sense being around the people I loved. Mm. Uh, the career and the money and, and that path that I was on didn't really matter so much because I just lost my best friend. So I came home and I decided I was going to move home to, to continue to, to search for whatever I was missing for. And, and in that process, I found a school that was on an 0-23 game losing streak that hadn't won a game in three years at Park Rose High School. A bunch of tough kids in a tough part of town. And, you know, they were a, a, a school, a team without a coach, and I was a coach without a team. So it kind of it worked out that way, and, and I was blessed to find them and, uh, you know, make an impact there. How, how, do, you, how do you turn a team around – that has lost that many games in a row where a lot of the kids hadn't played football before. And then you ultimately, like in two seasons, right, got them to their first ever playoff win at the state level. How do you actually get these kids to perform? And don't say give it 110% because that, <laughs> save that for uh, the uh, sports interview. That is a good recipe though for success. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, I just don't understand how you teach kids, how you coach kids up and get them like, running, catching, <laughs> throwing that much better in two seasons. How did you do that? I think it comes down to trust and just me being the adult in the situation, the coach and the, the mentor to those young men in that, in that program. And, you know, I showed them that I was willing to commit to them and, and fight their fights with them, that I was willing to show up day in and day out with them uh, before I ever asked anything of them. And then once I started to show them uh, that I was there for them and, and willing to fight with them, uh, they decided to trust me, and once they started trusting me, and I started sharing some of my story of, of why I came back home, uh, stories about my friends and, and, and stories about me playing football and those things, um, you know, that trust continued to build. And, and once you have trust, with, with, especially with a young person, uh, once you have trust with them, then they'll do anything for you. You know, they'll run through a wall for you. And, uh, you know, as a coach, I tried to commit as much as I could to them, and they returned that favor. Um. Now, you uh, were the football coach, you were also the track coach, and then you were one of the security guards at Park Rose, which you write in the book was, uh, to some degree, just because you liked being kind of at ground level with a lot of those students, seeing them in the halls, both your players and just other students at the school. Uh, I'm curious, what is a regular day like as a security guard at a 
public high school? Like, what are the calls you get called out on typically? Every day was different, I'll say that. Uh, some of the calls were calls to break up fights and escort kids to A and B places. It was a, a job that was a very thankless job, but, but once I started to really do it and once I started to live it and, and be with those kids day in and day out from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m., you know, I really started to see what they go through uh, mm -hmm. on a daily basis, and I really started to see the struggle some of those kids were really fighting every single day. Well, and that obviously became extremely relevant on uh, this day in May, back in 2019. They asked that you would uh, go to a classroom and escort a kid out of the classroom. Did you know why you were uh, going to be taking this kid somewhere else? No, un unfortunately I didn't know, but like I said, that was just kind of the job. It was, security, can you please go do this job for us real quick and bring the student here? And that was pretty much all I knew. So it was, uh, it was pretty surreal when I got there. Because you get to the class, and he's actually not in the classroom, this particular student. And you're asking around, is this guy here? And they say no. And then you turn around, and he comes into the classroom and basically pulls a shotgun out. What goes through your mind? Yeah, I'm, I'm in the classroom for about probably 30 seconds um, asking where the kid is and... and 30 seconds later, I'm probably four feet from the door, just on the inside of it, and that door opens up, and there's a young man uh, with a big coat, and he pulls out a shotgun right in the doorway, probably about four, four or five feet away from me. So it was, a, it was like a movie. Everything seemed to go slow motion, and I was able to, to think very clearly for whatever reason, um, and I was able to analyze it really quick and see the look in his eyes first and foremost, and I could tell it was a young man that needed help, a young man going through a mental health crisis. And, uh, you know, kids are obviously screaming, and, and uh, it was a really scary situation. But for, for whatever reason, my instincts told me to stay calm. My instincts told me to go lunch for the gun. And once I grabbed the gun, we kind of wrestled around the classroom and spilled into the hallway. And that's kind of where that viral video uh, starts there, mm -hmm. where, where I'm able to take the gun from him and hand it off to a teacher. And then ultimately, I decide to give him a hug. When you, were, when you were grappling with that gun, I mean, I think it's uh, important to clarify that this student was uh, attempting to harm themselves, and they pointed the gun at themselves. And something I didn't realize until I read this book that was remarkable was uh, they pulled the trigger, and it clicked. Yeah, it was a scary situation. Like, what are the chances of that shotgun jamming in that particular way? Yeah, one, one in a million. You know, there was some divine intervention, I would like to think. Yeah, and when you look at just the whole story in itself, and even just my whole journey, mm -hmm. I, you know, what are the chances I'm in that exact spot at that exact moment for that kid going through a mental health crisis that decided to do that on that exact day? Yeah. And then the only reason I ultimately, how I ended up at that school is because I lost my best friend. You know, I, so yeah. I lost, in losing my best friend and, and him losing his life, I ended up saving a young man's life inside of school by following my heart. So yeah. it was really special, and, and uh, it was really exciting to put that into words. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I heard this story, you know, three years ago, uh, and I was so excited when I learned that you had written a book. And it just makes me so curious, having told the story on TV and, and for people and for reporters for so many years. How did you feel about the opportunity to put it into words and how did you approach it? Because it must be so codified by the time you get this book opportunity. Yeah, it was, it was really cool to figure out that structure and, and be creative in that way. Mm. And, um, you know, that moment, a lot of people have seen that and I've gotten mm -hmm. thousands of messages through the last few, few years saying thank you and whatnot because they've seen that video. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I like to think that there's a whole bunch more that led up to that yeah. video, you know? And that was what, exciting to be able to put that into words. Yeah. You know, whether it was stuff I've learned when I was a kid, growing up with an awesome single mother who's here tonight. Yeah. Hey, yeah. shout out. And, and, and learning from awesome coaches that I've played for and got to coach under in the NFL and then the experiences I had with, with my best friend. And, and, you know, I've just been through so much in life. You know, I, I had kids that were, that were homeless that mm -hmm. I coached at Park Rose. I had kids that had anger issues that went to, went to bed hungry mm -hmm. at, at that school. And, and uh, so, so my story and the story of, of what happened in that hallway is just is so much more yeah. that led up to that moment 
where mm -hmm. all that led up to, to my instincts telling me to just take care of this young man, mm -hmm. hug this young man, and tell him that you care about him. And, mm -hmm. and you know what? When, when you tell someone you care about him, you don't know how, how far that can go for that person, whether you know him or not. Yeah, yeah totally. Um, what is it like for you to have this probably be maybe the defining kind of moment of your life? Because you've been talking about how this was a journey for you of becoming Keenan Lowe, who could be in that moment present enough to do this thing. But that isn't your whole life. That, this, is, this was two minutes of your life that is now the thing that a lot of people know you for. What's that like for you to have a quick moment be what you are known for? Yeah, it, it, it's pretty cool. But before that, I was known for being a good football player at Jesuit High School. And then I was known for being a good football player at the University of Oregon. Then I was known for being a young coach. And then, if, you know, so it, yeah. so, it, so it just changes. You know, this journey of life is, you know, you only got one of them, you know. And, and for my life, I've decided to do good things for, for people that, may, whether I know them or not, I'm going to continue to treat people kindly. And, and I figured out in my life, it, the, the nicer I am to people and the, the more kind I am to people, all of a sudden, People are really nice to me, too, and it feels good. So mm -hmm. it's a pretty simple recipe that, you know, I think everyone can, can solve that, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, wow. <laughs> it, um, it's been a real honor getting to talk to you, Keenan. Thanks Thank again you. for all you've done. Keenan Thank Lowe, you. everyone, right here on Livewire. That was Keenan Lowe recorded in front of a live crowd at the Alberta Rose Theater in Portland, Oregon. Keenan's book. Hometown Victory, a coach's story of football, fate, and coming home is available now. I'm Luke Burbank, here with Elena Passarello. We've got to take a quick break, but don't go anywhere. When we come back, we're going to hear a chat and also hear some music from musician John Craigie. And we'll find out what bad word he is allowed to say on public radio. I don't know what that is. I guess we're all going to find out together in a minute here on Livewire. Welcome back to Livewire from PRX. I'm Luke Burbank here with Elena Passarello. Okay, before we get to our musical guest this week, a little preview of next week's show. We are going to be talking to the very funny comedian Hari Kondabalu about this uh, Netflix show that he co-hosts with Megan Stalter. It's called Snack vs. Chef. It features 12 professional chefs competing to recreate iconic snack foods, which it turns out is way harder than you think it would be. Plus, we've got music from Margot Silker. In the midst of, of the sort of height of the pandemic, I was driving around here in Portland and I heard a Margot Silker song on the radio. And I had that moment where I pulled my car over and I texted our executive producer, Laura Haddon. I said, can we please track down Margot Silker and bring her on Livewire? And look at this, dreams come true. She's gonna be on the show next week. And we've also got a listener question that we would love to get your response to. Elena, what are we asking the listeners for next week's show? What snack takes you back? <laughs> Tell you what, snacks can be very nostalgic, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, gushers, come on. Uh, if you've got a snack that takes you back, let us know about it by way of Twitter or Facebook. We're at Livewire Radio pretty much everywhere. All right, our musical guest this week has been called the love child of John Prine and Mitch Hedberg. Those are two quality individuals. He's played with Jack Johnson. He's gotten fan mail from Chuck Norris. Uh, he describes his style as humorous stories mixed with serious folk. His latest studio album, Mermaid Salt, which is really good. Really enjoyed this record. It's out now. Uh, take a listen to this. It's some chatting and some music from John Craigie, recorded in front of a live audience at the Alberta Rose Theater in Portland, Oregon. Yeah. Hi, John. Welcome back to Livewire. Thank you. It's good to be here. I love this new album. It is just a really great listen. And it struck me that you really are a, a really talented musician. And I think there could be a potential for a little bit of that to be lost because you're also a really funny storyteller, Thanks. very folksy. But it's not like you're a guy telling a story and you just kind of are like dinking around on the guitar. Like there's a real musicality to what you do. Do you yeah. feel like every once in a while you want to reaffirm that with folks? <laughs> <laughs> I think that just is coming slower. You know, I think I, as a kid, I was the funny guy. So people who knew me as a kid, they'll come to the show and they're like, Hey, not bad on the music, you know. <laughs> you didn't even have to look at the guitar when you were playing yeah. it. You just know all those chords. That's been a slower grow for me. You know, I think with, 
I'm still learning a lot with music. So I like those kind of compliments because yeah. I feel I feel that way with each album. I feel like I learn a new chord or something. And <laughs> yeah. uh, so you're going back out on tour and you're going to play the Ryman yeah, Auditorium yeah. in Nashville yeah. uh, with Mary Chapin Carpenter. Yeah. Holy. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's pretty cool, right? Is that like on your list of places that, you know, you might dream to play someday? Yeah, I think it's the only thing on the li- I don't. That's not a <laughs> list I keep, you know. Uh, my goals are usually more lo- like more obscure, but <laughs> I think if, if I had a venue dream list, it would just be that one. So yeah. I'm excited to, I got to pick a new one now, you know, yeah. after that. <laughs> um, what song are we going to hear? I want to do this song. It's called Lori Rolled Me a J. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I got an email this morning from my manager, Phil, and he said, uh, uh, Livewire had some thoughts on the song you were going to play. <laughs> and I said, oh, cool. And he said, they're worried about the lyrics. And then he sent me the quote, and the quote was, hey, Phil, the drug stuff is great. <laughs> <laughs> Which, that made me happy. <laughs> but he says a few bad words in the song, so could he not? And I, was, I said, no problem. I know how radio is. Uh, I've done this before. Not just this, but other things. Sometimes they catch me off guard, which is hard. One time I was at this show, I was about to get on stage, and the guy was like, John, listen, uh, this is going to be broadcast on the radio, so could you not say any bad words? And I was like, oh, man. I wanted to. <laughs> and he said, which ones? <laughs> And I said, most of them. (laughs) So he thought for a second, and he was like, you know what? I'll give you ass. (laughs) And I was like, excuse me? He said, the word, I'll give it to you, because uh, he said, ass is in the Bible. I said, I don't think I use it in the biblical way. (laughs) He said, but you want more than ass, right? And I said, yeah. So he said, well, here's what we could do. He's like, do you have like a song where all your bad words are in one song? Because you could play that first, and then we'll just start recording afterwards. (laughs) And I was like, no. I feel like that would be way more disturbing, (laughs) right? Like if you came to my show, my first song was just blankety blank, 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 blank. And then I never cussed again. (laughs) All right, cool, let's do this song now. (laughs) This is because I love, I respect radio. I love Livewire, we're doing the Livewire version. John Craigie here on Live One. I got my wings clipped, I got my trump checks, supposed to last me through the apocalypse. I spent it all on some left dish as a you to him and Mike Pence, oh yeah. About the burning bush, Noah's Ark or two of every animal. Is this the new flood? Is this the new plague? Is this the rapture or just the first wave? My lungs are clean, at least today. I fill them up, Lord, and roll me a J. I can't sleep. With Emma anymore She got too many chickens in her backyard Took the urban farming thing a little too far They wake me up each and every hour She'll kiss her housemate It's more convenient What with the lockdown What with the COVID It's too much drama for me to play I stay at home, Lord, it rolled me a J Yeah When 
to the protest It got crazy You lost your mask Running away Your friends got paranoid Come join my scene Make love for two weeks We say it's quarantine Don't come and sugar If you won't taste it This summer heat has got a sweat and no beards We watch the sunset from our cage Front row seats of lawyer rolled us to jail named Cedar, I had to get away. She was fine as hell, but she was too new age. She'd do that Wim Hof, don't take no hot showers. But I'm a bad boy, I need them hot showers. She got a crystal for every disease. Secure the COVID, she said it's 5G. Won't get the vaccine, cause of the track and chip. Hell, they can track me, I ain't do Track me on my couch, track me in my bed, track me texting you, track me left on red, track me in my yard, puffing my life away, gone like smoke a lorry, rolled me a J. Trump check supposed to last me through the apocalypse. Thank you. That was John Craigie right here on Livewire. His latest album, Mermaid Salt, is available now. That's going to do it for this week's episode of Livewire. A huge thanks to our guests, Catherine Schultz, Keenan Lowe, and John Craigie. Livewire is brought to you in part by Alaska Airlines. This episode is dedicated to the memory of our former Livewire performer and our friend, Andrew Harris. Laura Haddon is our executive producer. Heather D. Michelle is our executive director. Our producer and editor is Melanie Sevchenko. Our assistant editor is Trey Hester. Our marketing manager is Paige Thomas. Our production fellow is Tanvi Kumar. And Yasmin Median is our intern. Our house band is Ethan Fox Tucker, Sam Tucker, A.L. Alves, and A. Walker Spring, who also composes our music. Molly Pettit is our technical director and mixer, and our house sound is by D. Neil Blake. Additional funding provided by the Oregon Arts Commission, a state agency funded by the state of Oregon, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Livewire was created by Robin Tenenbaum and Kate Sokoloff. This week, we'd like to thank members Judy Clark of Portland, Oregon, and Tim Fredrickson of Spokane, Washington. For more information about the show or how you can listen to our podcast, head on over to livewireradio.org. I'm Luke Burbank for Elena Passarello and the whole Livewire crew. Thank you for listening, and we will see you next week.